Lesson 5 has several parts, some algebra, some geometry. All of it should be a review. The first part is on exponents and radicals. Let's remember what the radical sign means. When we have that, we sometimes we call that the square root sign or the radical sign. If we had the square root of x, isn't that the same thing as writing x to the one-half power? Well, that's what it is, right? That means x to the one-half power. A lot of times in algebra, we have things that we do to simplify. Writing that radical sign, that's a lot faster than having to write 1 slash 2, writing the fraction 1 half. So that's what we use instead is that radical sign. Now, remember this. If we put a 3 in that little notch there, that means x to the 1 third. In algebra, a lot of times we have things that are understood. Like when we write x, it's understood that that means 1 times x. We don't write the 1. We just write x. Likewise here, just the square root of x, the radical sign in an x, that means x to the 1 half power. We have to put a 3 in that little notch to represent 1 third power. Likewise, if we had a 4 there, that would be x to the 1 fourth power. And then we could put a variable in there just to represent any number. We always just write whatever that number in the notch is. It's 1 over n. It's x raised to that power. Let's remember another basic geometry, or I'm sorry, algebra definition. Say we had this, x to the 1 half power times x to the 1 half power. Remember what you do there? If you have similar bases, multiplied together, you add the exponents, right? x to the 1 half times x to the 1 half is the same thing as x to the power of 1 or just x. It's understood when we have a 1 up there. We don't write it. We just say x. <coughs> Likewise, the square root of x times the square root of x, that would equal x as well because the square root sign just means x to the 1 half power. Let's do a couple of practice problems. You can pause the CD and try to work these if you want to. I just want you to simplify problem A and problem B. Those can be simplified a lot. Lots of applications for problems like this. Uh, a physicist, a computer programmer, an engineer, they may have a lot of different formulas that they're working with and they have to combine them together in different situations and they won't want to leave them in the most complex form, they want to simplify those relationships. So all mathematics, not just geometry, do we think of what our rules are and then apply those. We, we use that deductive reasoning process in all mathematics. So here, think about what rules you know. Well, look at practice problem A, and we could simplify x to the one-third and x to the five-sixths because we know that similar bases multiplied together, we can add the exponents. So we have a one-third plus a five-sixth. We have to have a common denominator to add them. So let's change this to two over six. Multiply above and below by two and we get x to the two-sixths times x to the five-sixths. That would simplify to x to the seven over six. Now we have xy square root of xy, isn't that the same thing as saying xy to the one-half? And then we have y to the fourth and the cube root of y to the fourth, so we could just say y to the fourth to the one-third power. Now let's simplify that. We have everything in terms of actual numerical exponents instead of radical signs. That's how we simplify problems like this. Try to get everything in terms of some kind of exponent. Simplify it down as much as you can each, each expression. So we have x to the 7 6. And then we would have times x to the 1 half. y to the 1 half. Times y to the 4 over 3. Now we could simplify the two x terms and the two y terms by adding their exponents together. Let's just think about the x terms for a minute. We have 7, 6 plus 1 half. That would just be 7, 6 plus 3, 6, right? 
that would be 10 sixths or 5 over 3. So we have x to the 5 thirds. I'll write that over here to the right. And then look at the y's. y to the 1 half and y to the 4 thirds. Well, we have to add those two things together, but we have to have a common denominator, right? The common denominator would be 6, the lowest common denominator. 3 over 6, that's 1 half, plus 4 thirds would be 8 over 6. And so that gives us 11 over 6. Y to the 11 6 power. That's the simplification of that original expression. X to the 5 thirds, Y to the 11 6 power. What did we have to know there to solve that? We had to know that what the radical sign means and the related exponent for that particular radical sign. And then we also had to know that similar bases multiplied together, when we have that kind of a relationship, we can add the exponents in order to simplify an expression. Now, let's go on to problem B. We can use the same two basic rules there to find a new truth about this problem. Simplifying it is a way to find a new truth about it. That's what we do with deductive reasoning, right? We apply rules to find new truths. Okay, simplify as much as you can within each expression first. And we would have, let's just work with the numerator first. A to the x over 2, and then B to the 3 minus x. That's like all one thing there. That's a little bit confusing. Think about it like this. B to the 3 minus x times 1 third. So that would be A, x over 2, B, 3 times 1 third would just be 1, or B to the 1. And then we could just leave it like this, 1 minus x over 3. When you have a power on the outside of parentheses, like parentheses b to the 3 minus x to the 1 third power, you're multiplying that power by the exponent, right? Doesn't matter if that exponent is a single number, a single variable, or a sum. You just multiply that 1 third, in this case, by 3 minus x. Let's go ahead and put our denominator back in now. a to the 3x b to the minus 3x. Now, on a problem like this with a fraction, simplifying it normally means to put all of the variables in the numerator. So what we want to do there, remember what you do on that, think of another rule there when your reciprocal rule, a to the 3x, if that's in the denominator, that's the same thing as a to the minus 3x in the numerator. So we end up with a to the x over 2, times a to the minus 3x, and then times b to the 1 minus x over 3, times b to the 3x. Okay, simplify one more time here. Look at the a's. We have x over 2 and minus 3x. Well, we need to add those together to simplify. Minus 3x is the same thing as minus 6x over 2. So we can think of minus 6x over 2 plus x over 2. That would be a to the minus 5x over 2. And then the b, we have 1 minus x over 3 plus 3x or plus 9x over 3. So we can add those two x terms together. And that would give us b to the 1 plus 8x over 3. We had to apply another rule on that particular problem, didn't we? We had to think of our reciprocal rule for exponents. If you want to write an exponent, a variable with an exponent that's in the denominator, you want to write that in the numerator, you change the sign of the exponent. And keep that in mind for the rest of your problems like this 
when you have a fraction that you're simplifying, usually what they want you to do is write all of the variables in the numerator, and that gets rid of the fraction. It's not very simplified if you leave it as a fraction, and it's not usually very simplified if you have everything in the denominator either. So usually, unless they tell you otherwise, make everything, put everything up in the numerator, all the variables in the numerator. Let's review complex numbers now. Complex numbers can be a little confusing because we can't ever really observe a complex number. Like, we can see 2 of something, but we can't see the square root of negative 1 of something. Let's remember what complex numbers are. Think about the square root of 4. Think about simplifying that. How do we simplify that? Well, remember what we do is we think of two numbers. They have to be the same numbers multiplied together would equal 4. That would be a 2. The square root of 4 is 2. We think of two numbers multiplied together that would equal that number under the radical sign. Think about this, square root of negative 1. Are there two numbers that are the same that you can multiply together that would equal negative 1? Well, no, there isn't. They have to be the same. You can't say 1 and negative 1. They have to be the same number. So sometimes in mathematics, Square roots of negative numbers come up. I remember using those in electrical engineering, looking at alternating current. We had different formulas that we used that dealt with complex numbers. They, they show up not just in alternating current, but a lot of times when you're dealing with a cyclic relationship of some kind, something that has a frequency to it. When we start studying trigonometry, which kind of has to do with cyclic relationships a little bit, we'll be using some complex numbers then. Leonard Euler, E-U-L-E-R, he came up with a symbol, just a letter I. He used that to simplify his work when he was working with complex numbers, when he had the square root of negative 1. And he just wrote that square root of negative 1 equals I. Euler was a Christian. He wrote mathematics research at the rate of 800 pages a year. Pretty phenomenal output of mathematics research by this man. And he obviously needed ways to simplify that work. He was looking for things to simplify it. He also fathered 13 children, and, you know, he probably didn't have a lot of free time, so he was always looking for ways to simplify his work and his life. Hopefully you do the same thing. Hopefully you're busy, you're not just going around with nothing to do, and so you're looking for ways to make your life more efficient as well. So we use that i to represent the square root of negative 1. So that means i squared equals what? It would just equal minus 1, right? Try to remember those two things. i is equal to the square root of negative 1. i squared equals minus 1. You might want to put those down in your formula book that you're making, your spiral notebook. The standard form, do you remember what the standard form for a complex number is? We usually write it like this, a plus b i, where a is the real part of it, and the b i, that's the imaginary or complex part of it. That's the standard way we write complex numbers, the real part first, the imaginary part second. I call that the complex part. The whole thing is a complex number. The real part is what you're used to the working with when you think of numbers. Those are the numbers that you can see things with. You can see what 2 of something is. But the imaginary part, we can't ever see what 6i is of something. We can't observe the imaginary part of a complex number. And the square root of negative 1 is what makes a number an imaginary number if, it's, if that is one of its factors. Let's do a practice problem dealing with complex numbers. Simplify this expression here. And you normally won't see these in any, any real life application. It's just a way to practice and to help you understand what a complex number is and working how to work with i squared and i. So what I like to do on a problem like this is look at all of the i squareds, all, all of those that you can find, and turn all of those into negative ones. So here in 4, we have i to the 4th, which would be i squared times i squared, right? 
So that'd be four times minus one times minus one. And then we have two i to the fifth. So again, we, we could say plus two i times minus one times minus one. And then two i to the third, we can say plus two times minus one times i. And then minus three i squared would just be minus three times minus one. So we've turned all the i squared into minus ones. And now we can go back and simplify this. Four times minus one times minus one would just be a positive four. And then we'd have a plus two i and a minus two i and a positive three. And simplify this, we end up with seven plus zero i, we could say, just to write it in the form of a complex number with a real and an imaginary part. Seven plus zero i. Every number can be written as a complex number. Sometimes i, the i part, is equal to zero though, so we don't write them like that. Think about all of your i squared factors that you have here, because those equal negative one. We know that rule, and so we apply that rule to help us solve this problem and discover a new truth. This problem simplifies to seven, basically. Part C is on the areas of similar geometric figures, and I kind of covered this already in lesson three when we were talking about scale factors. Let's say we had this square that had side s to it, and then this square, and this may not be to scale here, but just pretend like this one, its sides are three times as big as the other square. So the ratio of their areas, we could call this one a1 and this one a2. The ratio of a2 to a1 would equal 3s squared over s squared, which would just simplify to 9, 9 to 1. So the ratio there of their areas, that would be the square of the scale factor between them, right? Because the square on the right, its sides are three times bigger than the square on the left, so the scale factor for that problem is 3 to 1. Looking at areas, though, the areas scale the scale factor squared, basically. The ratio of areas of similar geometric figures, that equals the square of the scale factor between those two figures. Let's look at a practice problem. I have two circles there. I want you to tell me what the ratio of the area of B to A is. What's the ratio of area B to area A? Well, let's just think about this. Let's just say B over A. It has to be the square of the scale factor, right? That's what we learned. So just look at the radius of one compared to the other. That would be 5 to 3. So we would square that and get 25 to 9. That's the ratio of the area of B to the area of A, 25 to 9. Now the units don't matter here on this problem because it's a factor, a scale factor. The scale factor does not have units involved with it. If we wanted to know what the area of B was, just given a scale factor and the radius of A, we could just say 25 over 9 times pi times the radius of 3 squared, which would be 9. The 9's cancel, and we get 25 pi. That would be the area of B. If all we knew was the scale factor and the radius of A. We want to figure out the area of B. We have the scale factor squared times the area of A gives us the area of B. Lengths of similar geometric figures are proportional to the lengths of their sides or for circles to their radii. Areas are proportional to the square of those lengths or the square of the scale factor between them. Last part of this lesson is on diagonals and let's just do a practice problem to learn how to do this. I want you to find the length of the diagonal from A to B. Now to do that, 
you don't have to get an exact numerical answer here. You won't get an exact numerical answer. But what we have to do is apply the Pythagorean theorem to figure this out. Think about it. I want you to find the diagonal from A to B. So the first thing you should do is draw this on your paper and draw a diagonal line from A to B just to kind of help you think about what you have to do here. Now we can assume that this is a right solid. So what we can do is basically draw a diagonal from B to the bottom of H and can you see the right triangle that forms there between B, the bottom of H, and then A back to B? We have a right triangle there. It has one side of height H. That red diagonal, we don't know what its side is, but we can figure it out because we know the lengths of the other two sides, 9 and 6. That's the hypotenuse of a right triangle with this as the 90 degree on that corner right there. So let's go ahead and figure out the length of that diagonal. We would just say c squared is equal to 9 squared or 81 plus 6 squared, which would be 36. And so we'd have c squared equals 117. There's the number of the stealth fighter, the F-117. There's a airplane with lots of geometry involved with it to help it avoid radar detection. Therefore, side C is equal to the square root of 117. So we can just put that in there right there, square root of 117. Now we can figure out diagonal AB. It's just going to be, I'll call it AB squared. That's going to be equal to H squared plus the square root of 117 squared, which would just be 117. And so take the square root of both sides again. AB, that diagonal, is equal to the square root of H squared plus 117. There's our answer. Like I said, we didn't get a numerical, exact numerical answer on that one. It's in terms of numbers and letters, but that's okay. Some steps to remember when you have to find a diagonal are you use the Pythagorean theorem twice. The diagonal has to be a hypotenuse. So the first time we use the Pythagorean theorem is to find the base of that diagonal's triangle that it makes with one side. And then we use the Pythagorean theorem again to find the actual length of the diagonal. Okay, well that's all for lesson five.